Hello there everyone and welcome back to TNO, the last of Europe, which you probably know by now in this campaign, but we're playing as this Philip guy. But Rustin's doubts next appear before the House Judiciary Committee regarding the crime bill of the blank is Mr. Bayer Rustin, sir, you may begin your testimony. The chairman of the committee said as Rustin prepared his notes. It only one chance to make his point and knew his skin color to disadvantage him with at least a few of these present. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Rustin replied, overcoming any remaining nerves and launching into a speech. I've come to speak today by the negative effects of the bill being proposed. I understand my fellow citizens' anxiety regarding crime and violence, but feel drawn to oppose this law. As written, the legislation is overbroad and will lead to over-policing of particular neighborhoods with no corresponding decrease in crime. As he spoke, he watched committee members' faces, noting contempt for amusement on the more right-wing members of the committee member, while polite concern was plastered across other visages. If I had a growing pittance to make not enough of them were listening or even cared at all, watching a televised broadcast of the testimony, Harp was also concerned, though for different reasons. He had not anticipated so far as activists opposing or opposition to the crime bill. Did they know they could trust him not to harm his communities? Doubt flickered to life within him. He had read the bill into his eyes, nothing had been out of place. No provisions blaringly flawed or miswritten. That was just the usual DC hullabaloo. He resolved and switched off the TV, returning to his work. There's nothing to worry about. A warning ignore and to Beirut with peace. Christopher Booth had seen much fighting in his time. He had borne witness to the Pacific Theater, been right there on the ground in South Africa, and even spent two months deployed in Indonesia as an advisor to the pro offensive forces. The Marines had made a man out of him, and he was henceforth sent around the world on a mission to do the same to other men. Being sent to Beirut to a local train to train a local volunteer force was practically a vacation. One look at the two dozen men he was here to get basic training to did nothing to dispel that notion. Most spoke some French, good. Some spoke English, great. Best of all, most of the youths came from the same part of the city. For once, he considered his deployment a lucky choice, but as they had an annoying tendency to do, problems soon arose. He did not know or nor care what a Maronite was, but the apparent presence of one in his unit made two uh, other men uneasy, and an argument broke out as soon as they were left unattended. He'd seen that before, Southerners and South Africans uncomfortable serving besides a man of different skin tone, but the men involved in the argument practically identical. Whereas it appeared that the incident had set off all sorts of invisible lines between the men. Maronites, Muslims, Shia, Sunnis, even Armenians. How the heck did Armenians get there? All supposedly featured in some quantity of our apps. The greatest or biggest mistake he made was asking why just those two Sunni troops felt it was necessary to start a fight with one of the Maronites. That set the entire group off of debate in four languages on family feuds, 12th century crusader states, and obscure religion movements. It was all too much. After 30 minutes of the circus, Booth decided to send the men back to their barracks and in separate groups. God forbid they see each other on the way back. The problems of this part of the world seemed entirely alien to him, and no one at the embassy was going to be of any use until service was up. Very well, Beirut may not end up being quite the vacation. Let's try this again tomorrow, and, and for the boys, well, we've got a couple we've already read about, but I do want to make sure we can help out these guys as much as possible. Ooh, cost goes up. Eh, well, we can kind of ignore for now. What's on the end side? And, and who are you? So, we're probably going to go with, ooh, the best weapons would be nice. I want to do features of innovation, but I all this stuff here is weird. Clock me in. Industrial expertise as well would be good too. Um, regularity and a solid, likely undisturbed schedule is one of the few th is one of the things President Hart misses most about his life pre-presidency. Now that he's seen the White House, Hart must expect someone to call at three o'clock in the morning because the Germans have been acting up again with some ultra-nationalist Japanese besieged American embassy. But before that regular rhythm of sen Senate work, tours of the constitu constituency and family time was a consola consolation that stood between him or stood him in good stead during his tenure. President Hart. Notice for a fact that many other Americans feel the exact same way, although we know their jobs are probably very different from any he's ever taken up. Clocking in and clocking out, such a work schedule is a great for basis for the American worker to base his week on. That kind of regularity and the benefits thereof will in turn also encourage people to work all, at all in the first place. Which in turn will increase the effectiveness of the millions of hour, or labor hours put in by the Americans there. Burning right? black gold, bloody red sands. With the Middle East erupting into countless civil wars, many... An avid reader of Commentary Magazine would expect some of the unusual opinion writers to weigh in, and Congresswoman Jean Kirkpatrick has. In her new opinion piece, Burning the Black Gold, Bloody Red Sands, Congresswoman Kirkpatrick offers a brief conflict report on the entire situation, from Sudan and Egypt to Yemen and Iran. Well, not as in-depth as an official CIA country report, and careful not to reveal any classified state secrets that the Congresswoman may have access to, Kirkpatrick's article provides a succinct and accurate summary of what is currently going on in the region. In addition to that, the article also asserts that the policy proposal and the avid readers of Kirkpatrick's work or followers of a political career will be able to predict what this proposal consists of. Massive military intervention. The Congresswoman stresses that it has never been more important than now to ensure that America and Olaf and aligned nations and sides win these conflicts. Kirkpatrick sees this as a crucial step to cementing, and in some cases, risk cementing, American influence in the region. In addition to that, Kirkpatrick cites the alleged Japanese and German interference in the area, calling on the nation to ensure that totalitarians do not scrape out a victory. Congresswoman Kirkpatrick's increasing influence is on full display here. While ordinary really read by a small part of the country, this specific article is being talked about by hawks around the country, and by doves around the world. The words like warmonger, imperialist, and fascist words that, of course, are commonly used to describe Jean Kirkpatrick. The fire burns, fueled by black gold, and the hammer raids. 
A squad room. It was packed this morning. The police been congr congregating around the donuts and the coffee the duty sergeant had brought. A new crime bill passed, vastly increasing police budgets, and donuts were now a common occurrence in the precinct. All right, fellas, listen up, Sergeant Roscoe Zabrowski, a grizzled veteran of the force, as he said as he entered. He reached the front of the room, made sure all were listening, and began reading from a clipboard. Starting today, as part of the new city and state statutes in accordance with the federal crime bill, we have new offenses to be on the lookout for. Loitering is arrestworthy. As are littering, jaywalking, minor vandalism, speeding, drinking in public, he read it on and on. The cops smiled, twisting as they munched their trees, head only widened as he went on reading. Unit 3, we have store owners on Lexington and King complaining of loitering. They described half a dozen, half dozen black youths, estimated ages of 16 to 20. Copy dispatch, request backup as we approach. The radio squeaked as affirmative as patrolman Cliff Ford uh, swung his cruiser towards the loiters. A group of young men standing in a circle talking looked around in surprise and horror to see a police car barreling towards them. Hands in the air, Cliff roars. He exited from his car, already nervous of being outnumbered, scared, mystified the men, boys, and truth complied. Calling for backup, Officer Ford summoned a paddy wagon and transport them to lockup. Finally, the city would get the cleanup needed. Cliff thought as he responded to another call from dispatch. The work could never stop, but it was worth doing. A new monster of the modern age, predatory policing is born, flying off the shelves. The Middle East was burning. New unique nation states were rising as the old established order was falling. Something that Congressman Jean Kirkpatrick had long ex been expecting. She predicted something similar in, the, in, in her 1968 book, Dictatorships and Double Standards. Of course, she didn't get the exact details correct. She had predicted the hegemonic ideology would be right wing, along national socialist lines and nature, rather than left wing, but besides that, she'd been a bang on with most of the things. She predicted the rise of a totalitarian, or perhaps authoritarian, depending on the rest of the role of government, and she'd been proven right. She predicted that the global oil market would implode, and that she'd been proven right, most of all. She predicted intervention from the Reich, Japan, and the United States, something that had certainly happened. Readers are taking notes on both the book and its author. At every major bookstore, at every library, Congresswoman uh, Kirkpatrick's book was in high demand. It offered a unique proposal on what to do in the Middle East, as well as the rest of the world. It was a real politic taking to its maximum extension, every day. Congresswoman Kirkpatrick received calls and letters from people asking her to clarify bits and pieces of the Kirkpatrick doctrine, questions that she would happily answer. She was doing what she always wanted to. She was helping to change minds and hearts. People who were previously opposed interventionism now found themselves in singing Kirkpatrick's tune and those who had already been in favor even more so. Every foreign policy institute, every international relations class was singing praises, at least the little ones that mattered. Georgetown, American University, Tufts, uh, Stanford, Yale all reached out to her for speeches and interviews or requests she happily obliged. Jean Kirkpatrick was a household name, at least in some households, and the Australia request sale of SLBMs. President Hart tapped the old hardwood uh, top of the resolute desk with a button or the butt of a fountain pen. A decision that could possibly potentially move the doomsday clock hours forward as he foretold his mind. Australia and nukes, he'd been getting tired of hearing about it. The issue of selling Australia nuclear equipped to subs had first been raised months ago, and now the scheduled meeting with the Prime Minister was just weeks away. The meeting would officially end the matter, but in truth, it all came down to the President, and better to come prepared with an answer than drag his headache out longer than it needed to be. Australia having nuclear weapons had, at all had been a risky move, giving them submarines, which, with the launch of them, there'd be no denying it'd be a great kick in the teeth of Japan, but it'd be a bridge too far, maybe. It could spell a disaster Japan and retaliated as sphere nukes in Southeast Asia was the last thing the public needed to hear about. Then again, an open member besides America having the capability to truly defend itself from attack could prove popular among the more internationally minded voters. All came down to a calculated risk. Hard stop tapping, flip the pen around and wrote a decision on the memo. What Americans are not risk takers, Australia will have its subs. Air on the side of caution, call it off. Oh, I drive through Dallas. The presidential convoy rolled up upon its newly paved smooth asphalt and saw the president and the vice president ride into the airport, hop off, hop off the heels of a successful press conference, open to break the silence of VP prompted a conversation. So, is today the day I finally get to take you to smoke a cigar with me? Not today, Chip. Sorry. Chip sighed and lit up the thick Cubano cigar stash in his coat. Can you believe it? Ten years ago, this roll was either gravel or didn't exist. Now, it's smooth as marble. A heart started out the window, contemplating, yeah, it's something all right. Philip blandly remarked. Meanwhile, Jeb, puffing out smoke, exuded more joy. Stop being such a war, for God's sake. We did this. We're doing this all across the country. I know, it's just Jeb interjected. It's just that there's so much to do, right? A heart nodded, and Jeb continued. Well, it'll never be enough. That's okay. We're doing what we can. Don't feel guilty because you're not dropping highways from space. Heart smiled, a recurrence from him, and then replied, I'm still not taking you up on that smoke, though. Increased the likelihood of Republicans and Democrats who vote in favor. Democrat support, Labor Democrat, responsible Republican, and hardline Republican support all increased by five. Urban voters will support the Democratic Party, as well as rural voters, with an immediate change in partisanship. Awesome. Look at all that. Let's pay off the debt. Absolutely beautiful, my friends. Um, we're in the work of social welfare progress. Social progress at least 100%, 70%, still pretty good. Not bad, and they're still calm. So overall, I think we're doing okay. As efficiency is still increasing. Um, stuff is still getting a little bit worse, which is still not good, as we do have global conflicts that we can help out here too, but honestly, as long as we're there, I'm not too super concerned. Iraq is looking pretty good so far, uh, but we're clocking in right now. Commerce will increase 10%, the spending power increase. 
Uh, the future's with you. Why not? Through the millennia of human history and into the present day, Earth's various peoples have preserved local cohesion through activities in their home, communities, and regions. For instance, the old towns of southern Spain gathered in bro brotherhoods during Holy Week every year to perform passion plays and carry great statues of Christ and the Virgin Mary. We're told that the Muslims congregate in groups at the end of their vision of, version of Lent. Ramadan eat sweet and savory foods in amounts larger than they ate during the entire month before. In many countries, all one needs is a field, and a goal pulse, or failing that, some shoes, then they can get to play soccer or football, as they call it for some reason. Similarly, given what little we have heard from the ruling, ruins of Russia, we know that one of the few things that unite those squabbling statelets is enjoyment of the old great game of chess. And President Hart has been told by James Aborzak uh, of small towns of Syria that speak the language Christ himself spoke, held together across religious boundaries by the study of and love for that language. We too in America. I have our own share of such activities too, but we need more of them for all Americans young and old. The communities that we have mentioned before hold together because they eat, work, play, and in some cases pray together. We too can have, can and have, must encourage this for as we have made clear this entire time, the strength of the community is incredible. As I'll probably pretty much show you the end of the war in Iraq. Ah, sign so Polar Air's uh, sales agreement. If you want to buy that, please go ahead. A dangerous current in the Emperor's Ocean. Well, it's not his ocean, it's our ocean. Clocking in. As we get to 1971, everybody, I hope you're having a great, great new year. Let's make it a better year than the last one, which was already pretty darn decent, so. Future's with you, my friends. And that should kill them off here. Oh, oh. Yeah, man, what are we doing over here? I'm trying to beeline in there. You go into here and do that, too. Royalist victory, we didn't get it. How about Yemen, yeah, but whatever. Also, I'm also trying to help these guys out as well. You, know, you guys just go ahead. Do what you need to. We're almost done here as well. Be great. Go do that as well. The Heart of Asia. Reports of the memos of Philip's State Department desk guys of late, no surprise to be sure, but the origin of the documents is. Central Asia is emerging from a period of strife and political upheaval with the announcement of a grand conference of everyone who is anyone in the region. Uh, it's been a dream a dream dreamt up by our friends in Turkmenistan, has been its aim at uniting all external forces, namely Iran and Afghanistan. Sure, we'll do that once, only a few days. The area is a resource rich and highly contested by the other major powers, making it all the more critical that we ensure our allies come out on top. Uh, opposing us is the Turkestan Legion, a packed aligned force infamous for terrorizing the populace and antagonizing their neighbors. It's undoubted that Germany will be throwing their diplomatic weight behind them as their ideal leader for Central Asia, an outcome we cannot allow to pass. Meanwhile, Japan looks on, on horror as an, any end to the chaos that were nearly put, put nearby allies in the sights of regional powers. Word out of Tokyo Sparks, we, we do know that they're sending their own agents and everything points towards them sowing as much division as possible. As tensions heat up and the former Soviet republics decide the fate, it must be American representatives forging new bonds and overseas the treaties. Else, the veil over the heart of Asia will fall for us once again. Do airlines even fly out there? Interfere the Turks Keynes Conference. Knees? Oh, shnikes. There's a chance to show the world that diplomatic unification is not only possible, but ideal. A victory over beliefs over the hateful, imperialistic shadow of the other powers. Japan has been silent. Germany is using their legion to throw wrenches on the plan. But with their effort, a victory of diplomacy over their tried and true tactics will not only gain us a strong foot over the ground, but on an ideological victory over the hateful bliss. Or hateful vile. We have 297... Sympathetic delegates, they have 111, 692 are still uh, unsure. Wow, if you want to buy that, please go ahead. Increase U.S. support. Clever political deals, more delegates, sent promises of power, all these will be done to ensure Olaf and supremacy of the Turks Ken's conference. We'll sway more delegates to our side. Begin lobbying, support us by 45, keep things stable. Public speeches and promises will be given to lower some of the tension that has been boiling before it's too late. Lower tensions, keep things stable. Change by negative 25, so Olaf and 200. Suspicion, suspicion of the prosperity sphere. There's too many coincidences and things don't quite add up. Japanese interests will be expelled from the conference. Tension. No tension, huh? Raise suspicion of Japan. And sooner we'll work prevent them from meddling in the conference. Under the table deals, whisper promises, corporate handshakes. We must spread chaos and increase suspicion of the, Jap of the conference, specifically against Japan. Well, there's no tension now. Well, suspicion of these guys. Japanese interests, huh? The hammer falls. Oh, it was a rest for jaywalking, loitering, and littering. I can honestly say I only did the first two. I was brought up to throw away my trash properly. When the police stopped me, I thought it was a joke. I tried to walk away, but they hit me and threw me to the ground where they handcuffed me. I spent six months in prison. I've not been able to get a job since. I didn't do anything. The cops say I was drinking in public, but it was water. Of course, they waited until my body was empty to confront me. When they took me to jail, uh, I thought something was wrong. This used to be the kind of thing you handed, handled with a fine. I spent four months in the county jail. I lost my job and was evicted from my apartment. I don't know what I'm going to do. My husband, husband was arrested for speeding. He worked long shifts and was always excited to come home to his family afterwards when it sometimes rush. When he called me, I thought it was a horrible joke, but it was actually the last time I ever spoke to him. He died in prison, a heart attack when he was just a week away from freedom, since he was, and since he was a black man, no one important seems to care. I don't know what you can do, Mr. Russell, but I hope you can do something. 
Uh, Bayard Russ nearly jo- dropped the letters as he reached the final line. He saw clearly the jaggedness of the words appear as the writer struggled to control her emotions. His head in his hands, he felt like weeping. This was precisely what he had been fearing, and what he had warned the country, Congress, and the administration of. They did not listen to him, to the others who had warned them, and his people, his community, would be paid for their arrogance. A mosaic of human misery, a crime across the nation, and we do have some mint tea to keep us nice and warm. But... Uh, making America. The essence of fascist Italy at its inception was the blind adherence of the King Emperor and the Duce, or Douche. As DOS staffers like to call him, the essence of Germany is an even more blind devotion to race, genocide, and the Fuhrer. The essence of Japan is psycho- psycho- psychotic ultranationalism, worship of the bookish uh, marine biologists that call an emperor, and colonialist brutality that might even give King Leopold pause. And then what is the essence of America? It's simple. With all this truth to be self evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure their rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Yet at the same time, to our undying shame, we must remember another set of words. What, too, the slave is your Fourth of July. To him, your celebration is a sham. Your boast of liberty and unholy license, your national greatness, swelling vanity, your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless. Your denunciations of tyrants, brass, fronted imprudence. Your shouts of liberty and equality, hollow mockery, your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgivings, with all your religious parade and solemn. Are to him mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, and hypocrisy, a thin veil to cover up crimes which would disgrace the nation and the savages. Our work will not be complete until we can prove these words wrong, wrong, and make it so that all Americans, regardless of race, can partake in the freedoms handed down to us by our founding fathers. Um, zip it and lock it. Um, decrease that. Getting faith. That's not bad. Breaking the red bars. Increase progress. Efficiency will decrease. Upgrades goes up. Alternative movement. Alternate changed alternative energy. That wouldn't be bad. Lose a little bit of trust, which we can afford right now. Which I should have done this one before, but alternative movement maybe. Buses, bikes, boots, tr- boats, trains, trolleys, and trams are all alternatives to driving. The Hart administration wants it sees it would be a beacon of alternative transport. Driving won't have to be the only option to go to a concert, club, or wherever Urbanite wishes to go. And also, people keep in shape. The option to walk is a big factor in health. So quite literally, it's a public health matter to present alternative forms of transport for the American people. Whether it's bike lanes, bus lanes, or elevated tracks, we'll leave all portions or options on the table for urban planners and architects. Once more into the breach, though. If President Hart had known, only, known exactly how often detente would mean sitting across from Henry Kissinger, he might not have embarked on it at all. But the work was important, as his advisor never seemed to miss a chance to remind him. Our success. Uh, successes henceforth have been, a, of course, been impressive. But the cumulative effort has been a little more than laying the groundwork. He spoke as if the leader of the free world was just another college student. If we're to transform that groundwork into real p- geopolitical advantage, our task is to build towards cooperation against the influence of Germania. Cooperation with the people who destroyed Pearl Harbor? Hart grows his eyebrows? Kissinger shrugged. We'll not call it that, of course. We'll agree merely to scout down military activity in our areas of conflict. That, of course. We'll then free up our resources to push at the frontiers of the Einheit's back. Of course, no one will call it cooperation, but that's what it'll be. The Germans will be unable to compete with the military and economic might of two-thirds of the world. With your permission, I begin discussing next steps with Ambassador Takayuchi. What he was saying made sense, of course. It always did, but Hart didn't need to ask what more detente would mean. More discreet group meetings. More risk every day of a scandal that destroyed all, and all spirited by a man who saw nothing wrong with lying, who Hart was beginning to feel. Would be more comfortable bowing to an emperor than sitting across from a representative of the people, but he had brought them this far. Weakness. Despite the Hart's administration's bluster about urban reform being tough on crime, recent FBI statistics show that crime has risen since President Hart took office and enacted his major crime bill. It's a natural resort of President Hart's misplaced idealism and natural tendency towards being soft on crime. Criminals are emboldened and good citizens are afraid so long as the president is more focused on integration and city planning than actual crime control. The growth in crime is particularly focused on petty crime, showing clearly that President Hart's efforts have been emboldened rather than petrified the lowest criminals in America. The president's liberal fixations prevent him from recognizing the criminal as an enemy, instead of blindly holding to his view of villain as society's victim. Whatever is driving the current rise in crime, Philip Hart is clearly not the man to meet it. One doesn't stop a criminal with a reform infrastructure system or new welfare system or program. If you want to deal with a criminal, you must put them in chains until their debt to society is paid. With a permanent solution to or for worse characters. Our may live in a world where theory and ideas take precedence, but in real world, citizens are going to suffer and die because criminals are not being dealt with. Tonight on CBS News, we discuss the recent rise in crime, which... With us, we have retired Police Chief Martin Short, Cincinnati Neighborhood Watch Leader Fred Bingham, and Melvin Sheen, a lead prosecutor for New York City. Gentlemen, what is behind the recent rise in crime? Well, I'm telling you, the governor and, and Phil uh, are hard and similarly don't seem to be helping out at all. A constant beat of negative negativity and fear, which sucks for us. The floodgates. We have at last completed the work, long work of crafting an effective recipe for construction of successful American communities able to match and surpass the cohesion, achievement, and economic output of the best in our country and neighbors and rivals. 
A cabinet in Geneva, among other things, promoting work scheduling, strengthening community cohesion, pouring funds into community activities, and backing local businesses. We have created communities capable of guiding themselves, making their own money, and in general, simply further the work that we put in to assuring the best it can possibly be. Having succeeded in this, it's time for us to receive in turn fruits of our labor. As a farmer labors over a single plant or tree or receives in due time the return of his or her diligent work, we too will be able to oversee the successful economic results of our tireless efforts. We will ensure that our children and the elderly will be able to live out their lives in greater peace than ever before, and that the people that come into the workforce, both public and private, will be healthy or happy and more loyal to the United States and its ideals than they were in the past. All the King's men, Mr. President. You have to forgive my tardiness. I'm still early, but not as early as I wish I was. Carl Albert jested as he shook off the winter cold in the town of McAllister, or Mc McAllister Oklahoma. No, no, come on, pull up a chair. Uh, I and Chip were just making revisions to the speech. Now we're getting around to lunch. Boy, these Oklahoma caterers know what they're doing. Heart remark. Complimenting the sandwich and the Sam. No thanks, but I wouldn't mind some peace and quiet. Always too good to get away from the capital. The House Speaker remarked while seating himself comfortably. In an executive office in Guangdong or the Volkshalle in Germania, one would expect the upper echelons of power to have a heated discussion concerning the villainous machinations instead. In the small town of McAllister, Oklahoma, the top three men in the line of succession talked about simple things. Chap will buy you boy, complain about this bitter coal, proposing a presidential trip to New Orleans to celebrate Mardi Gras. We'll just have to go to Zadzai as a slip, and we'll be good to go. Give them a slip. I reckon Morrison and Muse, the free time slowly ticked away. Now the three made ready to deliver a speech reaffirming their intention to hack away at the racist institutions of America. In America, all this can be done in broad daylight. Yeah, at least for now. It's not bad, but I guess we have to really focus on crime. Um, I think I heard this last time, but... It's pretty quick. All police officers' duties to protect and serve. A lot of our departments across America seem to have forgotten that. It's high time to audit the law enforcement. Reward departments that are doing the right things and flag down the ones who are abusing their power. From the fl freshest beat cop just learning his patrol rod to the police chiefs of bustling metropolises. We'll put a new face law and order. One that doesn't create an image of distress and lack lesser effectiveness. A meeting to the other minds. Uh, Ambassador Takayuchi. Also, we're doing this one too. We're trying to commission as many power plants as possible. Uh, I felt like something of a secret agent as an uh, embassy car spirited him up Wisconsin Avenue in Georgetown. He could help but feel a certain resentment at all the secrecy. It wasn't as if Dr. Kissinger had to face death threats from within his own army. A car turned off Wisconsin and came to a stop in front of a pleasant looking house. Its bricks painted white. He dashed up to the step, two steps, uh, so up the steps, two at a time, knocking on the door. Kissinger ushered the ambassador inside. They sat across from each other on the plush sofas of his living room. You like French? Kissinger asked. Without waiting for an answer, he co his cook sat down and roast duck in front of each of them. They spoke as they ate. Takeuchi had to admit that it was really, really quite good. There are some difficulties with certain factions in the Empire so between sips of wine, but my government has endorsed the initiative going further. If I may, I think our next step should be moving to a treaty to further reduce tensions in the areas where our spheres of influence clash. They could then turn against our strike. Kissinger had a smug little smirk on his face. I was discussing something quite similar with the president earlier today. Great minds think alike, I suppose. If we could get down to business. Also, we can close this one out because it's just going to keep improving from here on out, which is a good thing. Good, 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 good. And yeah, the Middle East, we are wrapping it up very quickly, which is nice. So all we have left is Sudan, I hope. Um, I guess we could try to get involved with Egypt, but I don't think there's anyone we can really send volunteers to. So, so it is what it is. We're looking at the budget. $20 billion is not bad. We could continue cutting down the army surplus, but $108 billion is not bad either. You guys do that and go there. Do that, do that. Thank you. You guys go here. Boom, 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 boom. There you go. Do the best you can. Just go right there. That's fine. Uh, the floodgates, of course. Access. Ah. Since Holland sung in the air as Jane Jacobs stared at Philip Hart, he had always handed honest advice given out in the past, but today she had a much harder measure to give him. Jim Morrison stood uneasily in the corner, sensing Jacobs' coming challenge to Hart. Crime is indeed up, Mr. President. It's a direct consequence of the crime bill. We overcriminalized, frankly, with many minor offenses now being counted as crime, of course, and never spiked. Every litter of previously said and fine is now spending uh, time in jail. She paused to gather her thoughts and then continued. We know the consequences of that, sir. Ordinary people doing bad, but formerly not criminal things, getting so into the justice system incarcerated. At this rate, we're going. Uh, we're going to build more prisons. The states are already starting to talk about overcrowding. If you commit a crime, they should go to prison, Morris instead, taking the opportunity provided by another pause by Jacobs. Maybe you're right that we have a bit of wheat in the chaff, but... Did you ever hear of Draco of Athens, Chep Hardass, or was a rare interruption commanding immediate silence? The first legislator of Athens, he made even many petty crimes punishable by death. When asked why, he re replied that he believed the crimes deserved such a punishment, and that he could not think of a worse one for more serious offenses. Hart's words sank into his subordinates, his line of thinking clear. The two excuse themselves, exchanging worried glances behind them. Hart's head sank, resting in his hands. He has made the comparison revolted by, and he's worried that he would bear Draco's mark in history. Such good intentions, yet such awful results. It is what it is. Also here, how do they get more? Keep things stable would be nice.
We need a lot of uh, people there. Um, destabilize. I don't think there's anything here for that either. No, there's nothing there for that, which kind of sucks. So we gotta basically wait. Let's get more political power, even though we don't really need it, but that's okay. Uh, gambling up north. There's an old mantra, the only thing stopping a bad man with a gun is a good man with a gun. But what other bad man couldn't get their hands on guns in the first place? Our administration has therefore decided to work closely with the states to tailor gun regulation laws suited to their needs while still being firmly aligned with their administration stands. The end result is a pop that says well armed and well educated and firearm safety that will make the founding fathers proud. I don't know, man. You start talking about guns and potential control, and I'm like, people are, gonna, are they really going to go for that? Are you, are you sure? Maybe? I don't know. We'll see. Head down there if you can. A bricks in the windows. Nice. Gambling up north. Truce. Honest look at uh, order. The state of hate. Executive order 34498. Well, first civil rights act. We'll see. When Philip Hart was elected not too long ago, he always ended our office with a promise. He would always act on his principles, no matter how hard or inconvenient. Today, however, he has to confess some selfishness. As crime rose in our cities and gun bonds became commonplace, he did not act with a hasty promise. He allowed a powerful army of gun lobbies to prevent him from giving the nation the truth it needs to make decisions. The only way to repent for that failing is through good works and deeds. So here's the administration. This morning, Philip Hart has signed Executive Order 334498. This executive order will, for the first time in nation's history, establish a national nonpartisan commission to study the cause and prevention of gun violence in the country. Led by Dr. Milton Eisenhower, a well-respected academic and administrator, commission members will try to understand just what is driving gun violence and what comments and solutions we needed to address them. This commission's work will not be popular, especially among gun manufacturers, but it is a necessary thing. Now I'll do it anyway, so if we can. What the heck is a capital? Gambling up north. We love gambling here. Gamble, 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 gamble. Truce. With Hart and Jacobs fresh off the uh, discussion of the city reconstruction, Jeff's into the room with a cigar in his head. Another shooting in Chicago, huh? The media scene is up, Hart. There's got to be some control around here. Well, there needs to be stopping gun circulation then, right? What do you think? Obviously, there needs to be some action. We just can't sit around and let these firearms get into the hands of criminals. We need to control it, Jeff. Let the cigars he talked. Immediately, Jacobs butted in his chap with a cigar. Don't let that darn cigar here. You'll burn the place down. Besides, all that matters is crime prevention. What the, what the heck is gun control going to do about it? Uh, gun control is pro crime prevention. With, over, with control over guns, we prevent more criminals from committing crimes, for God's sake, Chet re replied arrogantly. Always, as always. Oh, you may have a point there for once, Jacobs sighed. The heart listening into the conversation remarked, Jane, agreeing with Jeff. Now, that's a sight. Game effectiveness in handling crime. Last legs. Camp David had never been this hectic. The president had hoped to escape the chaos of the Oval Office and the overbearing pressure of the Resolute Desk. Instead, he had, uh, the chaos of the world had tricked, it trickled into the placid presidential retreat. Not as he was wasted on the drive over, the Secret Service convoy halted halved due to his new gas budget. Oh boy. The president's daily brief had been in er begun in earnest. Philip sipped coffee with his American Lee Dumas. The briefing of the Reich was first, followed by the events affecting the corporate prosperity sphere, then various domestic issues. Most of them were thankfully mundane that came the updates on the oil crisis. It's bad, Mr. President, the aid informed him. Many industries are suffering, as you're well aware, but there's been an update. Philip raised an eyebrow. Is that so? Yes. John Murray uh, of the Association of American Railroads Commission to report on the railway industry and is yielding considerable results. Not great results. Uh, the aide pointed to the manila folder, hard open it, he would have to read the report in full later, but glancing at it, Phil saw the opening sentence. The energy crisis to the railroads is like a get-well card from Undertaker. We have mixed feelings about it. Hart sighed, thanked, and dismissed the aide. He could read the rest of the briefing later, but right now he needed to address this impending and figurative uh, train wreck. Get Secretary Mon Monrani on the line. Midnight oil. Kissinger and Takeuchi had been paying attention to such things, they realized it was two in the morning. And they were well into the second bottle of wine, there would probably be quite a few hours to come before they make much in the way of progress. But... They weren't paying attention to that, only the abstract world of geopolitics remained. The goal needed to, needs to be cutting down the military conflict as soon as possible, as far as possible, Kissinger said, jabbing down a fine cork that had been des designated as Hawaii. We need limits on military assets that the region put into writing, that's the only way that either side can be sure. That doesn't go far enough, in my opinion, Takayuchi said, gesturing vaguely where Southeast Asia would be. As not our planes, ships, or missiles that we use in conflict, but our proxies. I can tell you that my government is much less worried about your enterprises and phantoms of the Pacific than it is about the AR-15s that we keep fighting with terrorist groups from Manchukuo to Indonesia. 
and I could say easily seem about your friends in Cameroon and Jamaica, Kissinger gave a dismissive wave of his hand. It's of no concern, we're both working towards the goal of ending German expansionism. I'm sure that in more proper negotiations we can discuss these matters further. On that note, Takayuchi said, my government has authorized me to invite you to Tokyo for the next round of negotiations. The Prime Minister himself wants to meet you. Kissinger almost failed to resist the urge to pump his fist. But, not quite. First of all, it's act. Now it's time to have an honest and frank discussion about our nation's young people. Every day, somewhere in the country, a child is scarred by gun violence. It happens in the home where a young boy or girl plays with a toy they found in their daddy's nightstand. It happens in neighborhoods when they come across an act of violent crime by a disconcerted person. It happens when a person in need of psychiatric help finds access to a weapon they should not have. We cannot stop all these cases, but research by the Commission shows that we can limit when and where children encounter violence. Working with the National League of Cities and U.S. Conference of Mayors will support efforts to establish gun-free zones that will prohibit any individual from possessing a firearm near schools, libraries, and other sensitive locations. Obviously, these zones will be determined by each city and restrictions will be needed to be enforced. But the Howard administration can provide the expertise needed to establish these safe spaces around the country. Well, well, we will see. My god, trying to kill off Sudan is impossible, man. Heck yeah. Gathering some papers on the matter, Har aims to take uh, the mantle, take tackle the heightened problem of gun violence as soon as possible. It begins an investigation of what possible executive actions he could take. However, he cannot find much that could be of use for him. But the one thing has always been stepping stone to reform that is in his presidency would be the direct action. Shepard always drilled into Hart's head the importance of direct action in his presidency, and that had been a massive influence for him thus far. Our plans to ensure the party and the public will back him on his plans, so he plans to write executive order to, get, to gauge the support of the constituents, specifically on buying back guns and weapons seizure from all trusted criminals. God only knows the result. Alright, well, everyone will increase their disdain, but what else is new? An honest look at order. Whether it's Dutch Harbor in Frigid, Alaska, or the con co concrete streets of Chicago, crime will exist here. It's a fact of life. However, a response to crime can be changed. Our administration will survey every uh, police department. Whether they, whatever they need, we will provide. All complaints will be heard and most importantly addressed. How is that not enough to kill off this god darn country? I don't understand. This is ridiculous. This is this is, this is too much. They really re need to redo this. This is to the point where it's extremely annoying and it's not fun. Like my god, why? Why do you have to take every freaking tile here? Seriously. Like, bro. This is not fun. Like, this is stupid. This is, this is, this needs to be looked at at least once or once more one more time. Because this is this is too much, man. And also good order. A state of hate. There are many things that someone can do with a firearm. They can hunt for food, they can use it for pleasure. Most of all, however, they can use them to kill. It's an undeniable truth. Objects like this have an unmatched ability to end lives, and there are certain groups that uh, utilize this to great effect. Groups like the KKK and various national socialist groups unfortunately managed to get their hands on an upsetting amount of guns, but no longer. Following some recent tragic events, members of certain groups will be put on the list. Unless they'll make it much harder to obtain high powered firearms. Assuming we do it right, of course. And then. So this one will do. Arm Control and Indexing Act 1971. Equip to officers. Um. Not bad. Cooker officer something pretty good, though. Bimbo strutting down Broadway. Trigger happy thugs in Times Square. Muggers in front of the Omoma. New York City has fallen from grace, but is regrettably just one of the many urban centers that are infested with crime and drugs. President Harding Congress will pass an emergency funding bill to give the men and women of law enforcement the cash needed to afford better equipment and hire more officers and clean up our streets. Ring all. Phil wished he'd been more observant of the rail crash, but ever since the morning in Camp David, more concerning matters stayed needed addressing. That was until now, sitting behind the, behind the resolute desk, a breakfast ha bagel half eaten, heart read and reread the Navy's paper in front of him. Plastered on the front page in big bold letters, six railroad files for bankruptcy, more teetering and collapse. He read on, the collapse of the private railroad industry is already happening, the times of the industry. Norfolk Southern Union Pacific not yet faltered, however some, everyone knew it was a matter of time, as did Hart. Philip harkened back to his phone call with Secretary Monroney. 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 I understand Phil our team will be start drawing up contingency measures. I can come and come down and put a presentation on the cabinet when we're done. Phil bit down on his bagel once more. I heard rumor, murmurs from the Commerce Department, but nothing solved. Minutes later, he had Mike Mon Monroney on the line. Mike, have you seen the news? Yeah, rest assured we'll have it for you by the end of the month. You have until the next cabinet meeting, Phil commanded. It's essentially a euphemism to get it done now. Phil heard an audible sigh from across the line. He was about to address down the secretary until Mike said, We'll get it done, Mr. President. Good. And Phil hung up. Back channel, been 24 hours. Long 24 hours. As per our plan discussed with the Mexican and Japanese governments, Kissinger slept away during what was, as far as all but maybe two people doesn't on Earth knew, routine talks in Mexico City, he along with Winston Lord, a representative from the State Department, and two very confused and nervous Secret Service men boarded Mexico's presidential plane. Within a few hours, we were over the Pacific. 
Kissinger's looked down at the way as reviewed his notes and even managed to catch some sleep. The cityscape of Tokyo, stretching out into the park, apparently infinity, greeted the Americans as they entered Japanese airspace. This was not much fanfare greeting the arrival of the first American diplomatic mission to Japan since 1941. When Kissinger and his entourage stepped off the plane, they were greeted by the ambassador Takayuchi, a flank by some government officials. Takayuchi shook his hand, and they exchanged pleasantries before the ambassador pointed to a limousine. Kissinger ducked in, the curtains were drawn. None of them, not Kissinger, nor Lord, and certainly not the long suffering men of the Secret Service, say anything as a limo sped into Tokyo. None of them needed to, it was clear that what was at stake, diplomacy taking them as far to the heart of the Japanese Empire. They supported the president, if diplomacy faltered here, it was on them. The limo pulled up on, to an art deco mansion near the Diet, the Prime Minister's residence. Kissinger knew. A pair of guards opened the limo door, snapping to attention as Americans climbed out, and back of his mind, the mansion loomed over him. Kissinger reflected that what he could get used to this sort of treatment. He turned to Winston Lord. Let's Guns get started. Blazing. Hart had recently just signed an executive order for the FBI to begin their indexing unknown hate group members. This really wasn't much of a serious situation they needed immediate action, but rather just him testing the waters and public's reaction. America had a problem with far right for quite some time. Considering what had been going on for the past few years, executive order in question doesn't have much legal binding, but it surely still shows some effect on the public. Much of the American public either is oblivious, indifferent, or supportive of the bill. They seem like a, this seemed like a breath of relief. But what really bothered Hart was the reaction of America's nationalists, particularly coming from the NPP. Huh, wonder why they're unhappy. All right. Lightning Rod. <clears throat> Nationalization and electrification. Mike Monroney unveiled the infographic board to much enthusiasm. A simple three word summary of the Commerce Department's strategy to resolve the current railway crisis. It's a three step process. First, we purchase ra bankrupt railway assets. <clears throat> and offer favorable buyouts to the ones on the last legs. It doesn't matter if they were a freight train or a passenger line, we'll buy it. No putters current and acquired assets in one state owned company. The Consolidated Rail Administration, Conrail for short. Lastly, while the bureaucracy is being sorted out, we're going to go an extensive. Electrification process for rail lines across the country, completely bypassing a train's dependence on oil. After finishing the presentation, Mike opened the floor, a uh, two-man floor, to questions. Chip compromising 50% of the audience voices objections. I understand these are desperate times, but the strategy is going to be costly, time-consuming. You put a large target on our backs from the dead hawks in Congress. You say you can get it done in a year and generate profitability two years after that, but we don't have that kind of time. Phil sat down and stressed the American Legion mug and responded to Chip. The pamphlet Mike gave us was pretty thorough. I think we can assuage the fears of dead hawks, and in the time of crisis, we can propel public transport to the forefront. However. I must concede that this is more of a stopgap than a remedy to the underlying oil crisis. Chef, sensing Hart's hesitation, jumped to the opportunity to rebuff him. Right. And if these railways are struggling to electrify in the first place, doesn't mean they were destined to fail years before this oil crisis. It's a free market doing its job. Bill Pond and the arguments laid out before him, and after a minute of suspended silence, delivered his final verdict. Chef makes a valid point we should explore alternative options, nationalization, and electrification as a go. Nationals electrify rails across the country. It gives a bonus to mitigate the effects of the oil crisis for every railway we electrify from here on out. Inflation increase? It's only inflation. What's the worst that could happen? Especially as we'll read some comments soon, very too. And the, oh god, the Iranian civil war. In recent years, we've seen Persia become a wide breeding ground for oppression and ruthless authoritarianism during the rule of Pahlavi. Pressure from Berlin and Tokyo caused a cave in for the fragile political structure for the once proud nation. However, the people have to start speaking have started speaking out against tyranny and are shining opportunities developing itself right before our eyes. The National Front, formerly outlawed under the Shah's one party dynasty, had made a resurgence in the local population. And every class seems to show its support, farmers, soldiers, and noblemen alike. A surprising referendum. Directed at the parliament, the people demanded free elections, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, among others. The result, over 200 freedom fighters dead, over 1,000 wounded, angered at this side. The democratic politicians continue to speak out against the Shah, all while building up a com competent army in the southern half of the country along the Zagros Mountains and the Persian Gulf. A constitution was signed in the New Republic of Iran, seated only a few hours ago. Birds is the gate through which the Caucasus, India, Central Asia, and the Middle East can be accessed. We also don't want to be the barbaric German eagle spreading its talons over the oil reserves in Iran with a friendly government. Any chance for the Germans have at filling up their panzers with Persian oil slim that the liberals win this conflict, they could be our experiment with democracy in the region, a beacon of hope for the peoples of the Middle East. We must be hasty, the frail democracy is already, on the, is already on the defensive. Yet another struggle for the freedom we all need as we are doing the uh, you know, first so right. If you want to read this again, like we said earlier, please go ahead, but um, I know there's a lot of stuff about rails, and I do want to get to rails, but still, you know, transportation reform, good old market, old school solutions to modern problems, the Americar. I do really do want to do rails, though, but I want to get through this for stuff first. Uh, Arm Control and Indexing Act of 1971. Oh, crap. If I did really... Did I just run already up? I might have, I might not have. And I apologize if I have already, but the administration's commission in the caucuses and prevention of gun violence today submitted a progress report to the president. Its findings, two out of every three homicides are committed with guns, while one fourth of our nation's gun supplies are composed of handguns. They make up 75% of all gun homicides. What's worse, many of these guns have been sold without proof of need. The lack of restrictions and widespread fear of violence has caused an annual gun sales to quadruple in like the last five years. The situation is untenable. It required immediate action from the federal government and from Congress in particular. At the President's request, officials in Congress today introduced the Gun Control Act of 1971. Not only will this bill prohibit the interstate transfer of firearms by anyone but manufacturers, but also instituted a new licensing system for all handguns, restricting access to only those who can be 
uh, who can prove that they have a special need and not have been arrested for a previous violent crime. Anyone who fails to attain one of these licenses will have their guns confiscated by the federal government and provide adequate compensation. Let's not ourselves be cowed by powerful interests. We need this bill to be tough on crime. Good God, it sounds like they're going to destroy the Second Amendment. But, um, yeah. Some comments include, Dude, you must have banged this fast. Skip all the hot fix updates. Love having this on the background as I study. Are you ever going to play any more as a Russian warlord? I would love to play as a Russian warlord. That sounds like a lot of fun and I really want to. So, we probably will. Um, so, <clears throat> Let's see. Oh, and comments as well. Please, someone says, please focus also on real infrastructure. I know I'm just addressing comments by this point in the episode, but uh, yeah. Also, we did get Sudan, the Republic of Sudan, under us, or uh, uh, influenced by us, but uh, yeah. Oh, crap, don't tell me. Oh, we can't do anything here, can we? Oh, god dang it. I'm still trying to build more power plants, right? Yep. Um, ooh, they're not 96%. They're still pretty supportive, though, overall, which is pretty good. Um, preparation. I'm not sure what else we can really do here. Like, the Germans are gaining on us, and there's nothing we can do. So, yeah. Oh, so just Republic. I mean, there's... There's down Legion? Okay. Oh, there's more tension now, huh? Gonna move. and we're trying, Still trying to do that. What is this? Resolve licensing issue. Oh! Ah! <sighs> Send volunteers. Yep. You know, I understand that there has to be a lot of things going on at all times, but like, bruh. Like, this is ridiculous. But we do have a cup of coffee to keep us nice and warm as well. Oh. Oh, also, someone else, another comment was, just to remind you, mate, uh, Hart will have to maybe really leave in a certain year, so we gotta do his focuses as uh, fast as possible, well, apparently. I didn't, wasn't aware of it at the time of this recording, so. Um, private Eye. Rival the Japanese, ready to the Rockies, take talking down the bosses, full steam ahead, pimp my ride, operator, do's and don'ts, they answered everything. Well, the administration's allies in Congress today introduced the next key piece of legislation for our President Hart's agenda. The Armed Control and Indonesia Act of uh, 1975, or 71, I mean. The bill establishes federal standards on gun possession, forbidding the sale and possession of arms, felons, drug addicts, and the mentally incompetent. The act also requires that any individual or business involved in the sale of firearms must register with the federal government with firm limitations placed on an interstate transfer of weapons. And those bills have been controversial with gun rights advocating calling it a tyrannical power grab. For President Hart, however, sees it simply as a necessary step in tackling urban crime, exacerbated by the unregulated sale of weapons, often across state lines. If the American cities to prosper, must be first to be peaceful. A silver bullet against crime equip our officers. Bambo strutting down the railway, trigger happy thugs in Times Square, muggers in front of that MoMA. Uh, I think I've read this before, but New York City has fallen from grace, but it is regrettably just one of many urban centers that are infested with crime and drugs. President Hart and Congress will pass an emergency funding bill to give the men and women of law enforcement the cash needed to afford better equipment, hire more officers, and clean up our streets once and for all, of course. Alright, so now we can actually send guys over. What you got? Um, oh, we got guys all around here. They might have... They probably do have fighters, but you know what? I'll, I want to do some damage. There you go. That's some really high freaking damage. Also, we have a lot of inflation. This is really bad. Um, that's not bad too, though. New opportunities ever since. Oh. Uh, <clears throat> the railway shipping line he worked for went barely up months ago. Doing that now was a lily clerk at his local corner. The sun was setting over his hometown of Hasbrook Heights, a small a New Jersey town with a spectacular view of New York City. He may never be able to set foot in Syria again, but he was adapted well to his new suburban lifestyle. He entered his abode. He saw his children, all Ali and Nadia, running amok. His father, Anwar's attention, was on the baseball game on TV. His wife, Habiba, was in the kitchen cooking dinner. Abdullah was ready to inquire about her day, but she rebuked him. There's a man on the phone who says he's from the Conrail, whatever that means. Abdullah picked up the phone. Hello, I'm speak am I am I speaking to Abdul Nawar? A cheery voice blared from another then. Yes, what is this about? Abdul wearily inquired. Well, Abdul, I'm calling on behalf of the Consolidated Railroad. We know you have years of experience in the industry. We are a federally owned railway company that has recently acquired the North, er, North Bergen Railway, or Rail Yard. No wonder Abdul never heard of this railway company before. Your records have really stood out, and we'd like to offer you the position of general manager of the North Bergen Railway Yard. The salary trouble what you make with CSX, are you interested? $30,000 was a pretty hefty paycheck, life-changing hefty. Abdul eagerly responded in the affirmative. The man on the other end sounded just as enthused. Wonderful, come down to the rail yard at your earliest convenience to get the details sorted out. Abdul knew immediately that he could take the family to Disney World with all that kind of salary. Without any regard for the pan of mushrooms being cooked, Abdul took the wife by surprise and kissed her on the lips. Then, as he pulled back, he yelled, No need to cook tonight, honey, I just got a job offer from a new railway company. Let's go down to the Bennex dinner, Diner and celebrate. The American dream has now become a reality for the newer. American, or <clears throat> Iranian, Adibel. This is morning. 
The Congress passed the Iranian aid bill with an acceptable majority, giving us the power to send volunteers and military advisors to the national foreign forces. Until our equipment can reach the Persian coast, we have invested $100 million to keep the Libs fighting. Furthermore, this bill ensures that our lasting cooperation with the Republic of Iran, and we're now committed to keeping the candle lit for as long as possible. Already as the money flows into the newly established nation, the locals have been preparing us for our own, for our swift efforts. We've also been getting positive reports from the population here, and it seems people are more eager to combat oppression in Iran than ending the war in the past decade. We cannot fail the public now. Quite the lending hand to a faraway land. The military professional begins to improve. Oh, that's pretty good. Nice. Intensify volunteers. Got send guns. Well, I guess we can if we really want to. Improve loans. Okay. You know what? We got plenty of power to do that too, because we can. Uh, I just want to keep an eye on this one stuff too. How many more can we say? Just one? Alright. Probably wants to go need it. Oh, maybe not actually. We'll see. Oh yeah, we're all allied here. DP victory in Turkey. Not bad overall. Arms Index and Control Act. I know I gotta focus on this stuff, but still. Herculean task. Grand strategy of the Iran war. Our drones are currently divided over a potential strategy for the war ahead. Two options are given. Either we send our own men into combat to directly influence the course of the war to supply the national front from a distance and let the Iranians be the open ones fighting. The advisors support and direct involvement argue that offenses will be carried out quicker and that the results will be seen much faster. Our troops are much more trained and ready than the liberal troops. Americans may die on the battlefield, but the overall number of casualties will be lower than if we only sent weapons. Officers support and indirect involvement claim that the, if the U.S. Army lands on Persian soil, it could bring Germany or Japan into the conflict. And that's certainly not in our best interest. The public isn't showing support for any kind of intervention either, and it would take a resounding victory to even dent their disapproval. The advisors support and indirect involvement claim that, first and foremost, less Americans will be sacrificed for freedom. We can trust that the Iranians are capable of using the latest technologies we have to offer. The introduction of our arsenal is enough of a boost for the National Front troops. Germans and Japanese are less likely to intervene if we only send supplies. Critics believe this will produce a larger death toll and the war will be drawn out longer. We either send troops and risk it all or trust the National Front to take care of the job using our technology. Iranian men need to die for the freedom. We need men to die for the freedom. Yeah, I don't know. I don't want to send my boys over there, but whatever. Yeah, if we must get involved, we're going to do a good job, hopefully. The Armed Control and Index in Action 1971 fails in the Senate. Wait, oh. Uh, to the cheers of members of the NRA in the Senate Gallery, uh, President Hart's ambitious gun control law failed to pass the Senate today. Failing to garner a majority support, the bill foundered uh, on conservative opposition. Though it may have struck a blow against crime, such a question is not left to historians as the legislation has been abandoned, at least temporarily. Natural disappointment to the President Hart. Coming as a blow to this program of urban renewal. There's all we can do but lick his wounds. Learn his lesson keep his nose to the grindstone. Philip Hart resolved to persist with regards to the setbacks. Shall not be infringed. Indeed. Oh no, it actually passed the Senate. Go figure. Urban reformers, healthcare professionals, crime fighters nationwide today celebrated an ambitious piece of gun control legislation passed in the Senate. With the bill on its way to President Hart's desk, it seemed that the fortunes of American cities seemed to soar. Prohibiting sales to and possession of weapons to criminals and addicts, limiting the interstate transfers, and regulating firearm sales would be all key steps in a government struggle with urban crime. With many Americans armed to rising crime, the new legislation comes as welcome news. Thanks to President Hart's efforts, criminals will be unable to get their hands on dangerous weapons, and presumably rates of gun crime will go begin to drop as the laws affect our fellow. For tonight at least, President Hart and his administration can rejoice in a victory. A blow in the struggle against violence. So, crime rate will decrease tremendously by 16%. Wow. Crime combating will be decreased by 15%. Efficiency and happiness goes up. Because it's a game. Also, I only did that just because we had 75 people, senators saying yeah. So, like... I think it might be bugged. I know for a fact that this is not perfectly, um, a hundred percent, you know, perfect. So, I listen to some regulations. Um, in terms of the mod currently, I know there are some bugs. I've, I've noticed some people saying that there are some bugs as well on Reddit. So, and I do like browse Reddit a whole bunch. I don't spend a lot of time on there, but you know, when I can. I do just try to notice it, so, I mean, I, and we're still trying to beeline through the street, and then we'll go back to transportation stuff, so. Law and order. Racism, anti-Semitism, xenophobia. These things are all rot. A rot that's taken de root deep inside the country that we hold so dear and near. President Philip Hart is the cure to this malaise. Law and order. For too long, white supremacists and fascist elements have been allowed to survive and thrive in America's difficult political climate, climate but no longer. President Philip Hart will rebuild the country that we love, ensuring that these groups are fought at, at the source. No longer will young men feel that they have no other option, and no longer will these groups be able to become violent. Decrease likelihood of Democrats to vote in favor, but increase Republicans. Crime rates decrease. Nuclear consensus. The Empire, they have already agreed, is pursuing with the spirit of the decreased tensions to reduce its nuclear deployments on the following islands. <clears throat> Suva, Papita, Bora Bora, Truk, Oahu, Weig, Midway, Johnson, Eto, Rungata, Bariki, Tapiwa, Jobor, Wocha, 
Uh, blank is reciprocating this decrease in tensions. The United States agrees to limit its nuclear presence in the Pacific, particularly in the areas of blank. Australia, the Dominion of New Zealand and Alaska. We believe that these clauses contribute to the future of a greater peace and prosperity on both sides of the Pacific Rim. Down to the brass tacks, the treaty will involve reductions in American and Japanese nuclear deployments in the Pacific. Long term or short term, military plans are nearly complete, and high ranking officers are already at the crossroads. This time, the U.S. must decide whether soldiers will accept a swift advance to end the war, prepare for the long haul of attrition. Long war of attrition, really. <clears throat> If we send enough soldiers to overwhelm the enemy, there's a clear chance that the war would end once Tehran capitulates. However, if this advance fails, there will be a monumental loss of American life, and the war might be as well lost. So there's a big risk, but our troops can pull it off. The war will be run handily when we have our Middle Eastern ally. Uh, honestly, I just want you guys to go. Um, <clears throat> third, we can expect the long-term war from the start and try to wear down our foes over time. The war may be longer, but we'd have no risk of failing and embarrassing ourselves on the world stage again. At the same time, there'd be no chance of us with victory. This route allows for greater conservation resources, and all of our soldiers would have to do is hold it out a little longer. Uh, the idea may not so well the average soldier, but it's meant to keep them safe. Well, in conclusion, our military either risks the entire operation of one single offensive, or hold everything in the trenches and wait for the enemy to attack us. It's a matter of offensive or defensive. Risk or no risk, time is of not, it's not of the essence. Take a chance with a war? 240 days? I'll take a chance. Railway to heaven. My friends, this is only the beginning. Hart's opening remark garnered thunderous applause from the railway workers and a pedestrian assembly for the ceremony. The Consolidated Railroad's latest inner city route was about to debut. Uh, New York to Boston, and not a drop of oil needed to get there. The Hart administration had a flair for theatrics. A train truck full of the Secret Service and White House staff sailed on the eastern seaboard on electric sails. Awaiting them at Secaucus Junction was a public relations slam dunk. Slam dunk. Hart delivered a highly publicized speech remarking that the future of transport was here. Make no mistake, we're still undergoing a devastating oil crisis. However, you no longer to decide to pay your bills or are up to top up your tank. Applause once again interrupted the speech. My fellow Americans, we've created thousands of jobs, generated billions in revenue, and connected the country once again. Hours after the speech, Hardin's cadre sped down to DC in another electric rail line. Hart suddenly relished in his victory. Across sat from him, Jeff Morrison on the verge of sleep. Hey, Jeff, aren't you glad we did this? Bill remarked. Yeah, I am. Our risk paid off. Now let me sleep. He groaned. Oh, all right, chap. Phil st stood up and made his way to the coffee machine, approaching the machine and encountered a staff who was waiting for the rich coffee. Phil expected the man to become startled and start stirring, but instead the man barely acknowledged him. One of those nights, huh? Hart stayed past him. Sure is, kid, in the Cold War. Uh, one of the great troubles is that you can't simply wish away 90 million firearms. As much as Congress and the White House wishes the havoc could change with a stroke of a pen, the truth is that legislation and executive orders can only ra ever rarely be the start. Real change comes about through years of enforcement. That takes years. <clears throat> Now we can begin the journey down that long and difficult road. It's a path that requires cooperation with our friends, the police. It's one. Uh, that means empowering the Federal Bureau of Investigation and other law enforcement agencies to crack down on those who might try to circumvent our guns and drug laws, while cleaning up the streets and putting away dangerous criminals. Uh, we can reverse decades of urban decay and make America safe again, but I'm going to save that for the next episode because I need to you know, get some other things done. But if you enjoyed this video, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow as we continue on with heart and hopefully keep pushing on and see if we can build some... Eventually, some rail lines. Thanks for watching. Have a great, hopefully not inflated, rest of your day.